All right, we're going to get started here. So we are grateful to be joined by Dr. Jalone White Newsom. All right, everyone. One, two, three eyes on me. <laughs> Something my, my son's preschool uses. So we are really grateful to be jo joined by Dr. Jalone White Newsom. Uh, she was appointed on May 5th, 2002 to be the Senior Director for Environmental Justice for the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Uh, in this role, she advises the CEQ's Chair on Environmental Justice Policy and helps advance the Biden-Harris administration's bold and historic commitment to leveraging the full, full force of the federal government in advancing environmental justice. Most recently, she founded and led Empowering a Green um, Environment and Economy, EGE Squared, a strategic consulting firm that focused on transforming communities by using people-centered solutions to combat climate change, improve public, public health, and pursue environmental justice. Prior to creating EGE Squared, uh, Dr. White Newsom was a senior program officer at the Kresge Foundation and created the Climate Resilience and Equitable Water Systems Initiative, the first national grant-making initiative focused at the intersection of climate change and water inequity. She also served as the first director of federal policy for We Act for Environmental Justice, managing federal policy office in Washington, D.C. She earned a PhD in environmental health sciences from the University of Michigan School of Public Health, a master's from the environmental uh, in environmental engineering from Southern Methodist University, a bachelor's in chemical engineering from Northwestern, and a certificate in diversity and inclusion from Cornell University. Um, she also has two teenage daughters and three family pets, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. It means a lot. So this is hard. I'm standing between like you and food. This is unfair. How's everybody doing? You got to do better than that. How are you doing? Thank you. The folks online have to hear you. So first of all, thanks so much for the opportunity to spend a little bit of time with you this evening. Uh, Dr. Patel, thank you for your leadership. Uh, Mona, wonderful to see you. Dr. Mitchell, wherever you are, thank you for the invitation. Um, again, uh, I, I feel like it is wonderful just being in this space. Um, and to the fellows that just gave the presentations, I never thought about feet and climate change. So I don't know where that person is, but I, you have just expanded and blown my mind. So just so impressive. But uh, several years ago, a dear water justice warrior of mine, um, Elder Mona Stonefish, told me that every time you talk about resources and people on the planet that you need to acknowledge uh, the ancestral lands that you're on. So I wanna start with that, but also challenge you that we don't need to stop with acknowledgement, but really what does that mean in action? So we, we don't wanna just do something ritualistically and not have meaning behind it. So I want you to think about what that means as we stand on these stolen lands um, and we think about our indigenous brothers and sisters and the folks that have sacrificed uh, to pave the way for what you all are doing. Um, I take this to heart because I wouldn't be here if not for my mom, uh, my ancestors, those that have, again, just uh, sacrificed so much for this little girl born in Lima, Ohio, raised in Detroit, Michigan, to be in the White House, never would have thunk it. So I don't take that for granted. So uh, I would imagine because of the nature of this meeting, both y'all here in the physical room in the virtual space that um, you take your position, your education and your calling pretty seriously. And when you think about physicians and this thing that you take seriously, do no harm, that's important as we talk about climate change and health and people. So I just wanna start by extending my heartfelt thanks. I don't know everybody in the room, but I just wanna thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for your service. Uh, again, because you represent over 42 medical societies and some really big numbers, 70,000 folks across this country working. That is a big deal. So please applaud yourself, give yourself a hug, do what you have to do, appreciate yourself um, because you're here and you're showing up and that's what's important. And so when you think about this movement that you have created, 
uh, this, this niche that you have filled, a very necessary niche of climate change and health and bringing physicians into the room and outside of the room, that is important. And I don't have to tell you why this moment is so critical when we think about the impacts of our changing climate on our physical and mental health, um, particularly those that are low, on, low income folks, communities of color, indigenous peoples, those that are living in communities that <laughs> deal with multiple injustices. This is a critical moment. And our changing climate has literally shifted the way we think. Uh, shift the way we talk and react about weather. Because I remember 15, 20 years ago, there was nobody talking about climate, particularly the meteorologists or anything. So we, it's it shifted. It shifted the way we live in our everyday lives. And so even when we think about this reality that hits us every day, I'm curious in the question that I have for you all is what really drove you in this room to work at this intersection of climate change and health? Was it the fact that you saw a patient in your emergency room that was experiencing heat stress? Was it the increase in cases of asthma that someone talked about earlier in some of the children that you treat? Could it be you decided to go back to school for the fun of it and take some courses in something that you had never heard of? Or was it the fact that every time you turned on the TV that you saw some type of extreme weather happening, whether it was torrential rain, heat, et cetera, and realized that this was no longer some special phenomenon, but this was like our reality. And so the work that each of you has taken on is hard. <laughs> and it's important to remember why we do this. So when I think about my why for working at this intersection of climate change, health and equity, and I'm trying to bend down, I feel like I'm doing this, but I want to make sure you hear me. Um, when I think about that, why, you know, simply put, climate change was affecting the people that I cared about. And that's how I got started in this space. And so my non and granddaddy, who have gone to heaven now, uh, and many of the low income seniors in Detroit, where I grew up, you know, were in danger in their homes because of extreme heat, and they didn't really know it. They weren't protected by the environment outside of their homes. There was no green space. They weren't protected from their expensive electricity bills um, in many ways that kept them running the AC. They weren't protected from the safety concerns when they had to open their windows because they didn't want to turn on the AC, but they were scared to open their windows because of the communities and places where they lived. And they weren't protected from their doctors because in many ways their doctors were prescribing them multiple medications and they were not making that connection as to the, the risk of those medicines and how it made them even more vulnerable to extreme heat. So I came to this work to try and protect my grandparents as their caregiver for many years, meeting with their doctors and trying to really understand where this climate change thing fit in. And so I guess I was destined uh, to begin my public health career working on extreme heat because for some reason, I was a part of the Chicago heat wave in 95 and then the Parisian heat wave in 2003. But it wasn't just extreme heat that kept me in this space. Unfortunately, my parents a couple of years ago and many folks living on the east side of Detroit experienced a bunch of rain due to climate. And it was a lot of rain. And my parents in two years experienced five floods in their home that actually displaced them. And they lived with us for several months. So they lost a bunch of stuff a lot of family heirlooms, um, stuff they couldn't replace, incurred many expenses that the government would not recover. And they experienced the repeated mental trauma of multiple floods and losing stuff. And every time it rains, they get a little bit nervous. So unfortunately, the health connection is that some of the mold that resulted from some of those floods, because it was during the summertime, has impacted my mom to this day. So again, the overarching theme here is that the impacts of climate change are not going anywhere anytime soon. And so even in the midst of these challenges, we have the moment, we have the opportunity to seize this moment in a way like never before. And I'm so proud to be a part of an administration that recognizes the importance of seizing this moment. So for the past eight months, I've had the honor and privilege to serve, eight months or nine months, I can't remember, as the Senior Director for Environmental Justice at the Council on Environmental Quality, better known as CEQ. And how many of you all know what CEQ does? Oh, that's the norm. Okay, wonderful. So our role at CEQ 
is to really coordinate the federal government's efforts to improve, preserve, and protect America's public health and the environment. So the Biden-Harris administration is the first to create an actual environmental justice program within CEQ. It's never been that before, so that's a big deal. And so our CEQ, thank you. We can't take anything for granted if we have learned that. Um, our CEQ EJ team uh, has been charged with advancing the president's ambitious agenda. And again, to really think about and change the places where communities and folks live, work, play, pray, and grow. And so our overall vision is that the values of environmental justice become embedded into the fabric and foundation of the White House, the executive office, and all of our federal agencies. Because again, we have to serve as a model. And that vision is really encompassed around three big goals. So the first is to reduce burdens and harm in disadvantaged communities. The second is to make sure that we deliver investments to these same communities. And last but not least, our third goal is to institutionalize and advance environmental justice throughout the federal government. So I think it's important to understand who CEQ is as well as what we are not. So as mentioned before, we're in office within the White House, but we don't work on enforcement and we don't provide grant money. So I know that might disappoint some of y'all, but those are super important roles that our federal agency partners have taken on. And so again, I, we don't give away money, but we do have some superpowers that I want you to be aware of. So our CEQ superpowers, again, we are in the White House, which elevates environmental justice to the highest of the lands, right? We have the ability to convene and bring people together. We guide and advise our other federal offices on how they do their environmental justice work as they craft policy. We operationalize the president's ambitious agenda. And overall, our vision of embedding environmental justice into the fabric of the White House and our federal partners is our North Star. So everything we do should align with our three big goals. So again, as mentioned probably earlier, in his first week in office, President Biden signed Executive Order 14008 tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad, launching the most ambitious climate agenda and environmental justice agenda ever. And so the first national climate task force was formed with 25 cabinet level leaders of our agencies that are working to achieve goals around cutting emissions with one of my colleagues talked earlier. Last summer, the task force discussed how these climate and weather extremes disproportionately impact certain communities. Again, so they talked about weatherization of homes and updating building codes and shielding workers from extreme heat. In fact, federal agencies have also taken actions to address this intersection of climate change and health through the bipartisan infrastructure law, through FEMA's BRIC program, um, again, addressing the growing threat of workplace safety for our agricultural workers. And again, the list goes on and on. So in this moment, we have a federal government that is prioritizing climate and getting resources to communities that have been overpolluted, disinvested in, marginalized, and I just say sometimes invisible. And I know many of you in this room are familiar with the Justice 40 Initiative. How many of you all know what the Justice 40 Initiative is? Wonderful, okay. But just in case, as my, my sister colleague said, I believe in education. And so even if there's one person in this room or one person in the virtual room that doesn't know, I feel it's important to share. As my mom says, you say things once, twice, and the third time, hopefully you'll get it. So the Justice 40 Initiative works again to embed environmental justice into the DNA of federal programs, okay? So it's directing these benefits of federal resources to the communities that I talked about, the disadvantaged communities, through areas of investment related to clean water, clean energy, energy efficiency, affordable housing, et cetera. But what most people don't realize is that this Justice 40 initiative is not just a CEQ thing. It's actually a joint initiative between our Climate Policy Office, CPO, our Office of Management and Budget, OMB, and then CEQ. So everything we do with this initiative is done collaboratively and together. So the Justice 40 initiative, of course, has this goal of getting over 40 percent of the benefits, overall benefits to communities that are disadvantaged. And this includes new and existing federal programs, which is important. So those that are included in the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. And so there's more than 450 programs that are already a part of the Justice 40 Initiative, and that is going to be growing. But I think what's cool is that 
it's not just what's important that's happening at the federal level, but if we talk about climate and health and where the impacts really happen, it's, it's on the ground, is where you all are working. And so there are some examples that I just wanted to raise very quickly that I think are cool because they show how folks are making justice for their own. So they're using this federal initiative to drive home things at the local level. So we had somebody here from Cook County and just last year they passed a resolution, uh, the Justice 40 Infrastructure Fund Initiative to begin to build more climate resilient infrastructure in that county. Uh, in the state of Maryland, they've incorporated a commitment in the state budget that 40% of funds, at least 40% go to communities that have been identified as disadvantaged. And just a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to travel to Albuquerque, New Mexico, where the mayor of Albuquerque signed the first in the country Justice 40 initiative, a city level executive action. So again, these are just a couple examples of how communities, again, at every level, are following the president's lead in advancing the Justice 40 initiative to innovate locally and to help deepen that impact. So again, the beauty is that the work happening even within this consortium, and I don't know everything you do, but I just imagine that your voice and advocacy is gonna be critical for us realizing that, that benefit that we all wanna see of the Justice 40 initiative. And so when I think about Justice 40, it is more than just pushing out dollars and cents. <laughs> It is really the deep culture shift that someone spoke about earlier that has to happen. It's making sure that resources get to those communities that have this ridiculous reality that they're facing every day with multiple injustices, multiple cumulative impacts, you name it. And so that's important to acknowledge, right? Because in order for us to reach our Justice 40 goals, we have to take appropriate actions, but we also have to know the reality that our communities are facing. I heard some of that reality on the panels. And so as a part of Executive Order 14008, the president also charged CEQ with creating a geospatial mapping tool to help us understand a little bit of that reality. We know no tool is perfect, but at least gives us a glimpse into the reality. And so I'm sure I'm in a room where folks appreciate good data. And so to understand that reality, last November, we launched version 1.0 of the CEGIS, our climate and economic justice screening tool. And again, it's an interactive map that highlights those disadvantaged communities that I talked about that have been overburdened by pollution, disinvestment, again, marginalized. And so our methodology for the CEGIS tool is one that uses a threshold approach and looks at categories of burdens and shows that on a map. And so these categories of burden include climate change, energy, health, housing, legacy pollution, transportation, wastewater, workforce development. And so our federal agencies are using that tool to help identify communities for the purpose of directing resources that will benefit these communities. So there are about 27,000 communities that are identified in our tool and agencies are putting it to use. That's important because it's no good to have a tool if nobody's using it. So an example of that is HUD, uh, Housing, Urban, and Development, recently put out a notice of funding opportunity where they gave extra points to those that to those applicants that used the CEGIS to identify those communities to target. Again, that wasn't happening before, and that's major. And so I encourage you in your spare time, which I'm sure you all don't have a lot of, to check out the CEGIS tool on our website and see how it could be useful in the work that you're doing. So... I think it's also important uh, to be explicit in that CEQ can help agencies execute executive orders and we can guide, we can advance these wonderful initiatives and we can develop some pretty cool tools. But what we can't do is achieve our vision of advancing environmental justice without each and every one of you. And so the Justice 40 initiative is a pathway, the CEGIS is a tool. And I would say one of the pathways and tools that I have used over a couple of decades of my life to stay healthy is by choosing a good doctor. And so for me, data shows that a good doctor embodies several characteristics, and I'm sure some of those are in the room. They do no harm. They listen. They take the time to understand the full picture of my life. They have the right training and experience. They have a clear vision of what my health should look like. And they understand my constraints. And most importantly, they follow up. Does that sound like any of you? I hope, I hope. 
So I'm assuming I'm talking to some good doctors and practitioners in the room and in the virtual space that embody those characteristics. And I posit that your approach to your work as a doctor and as a practitioner is a much needed approach and a role we need you to play as we try and advance the president's environmental justice and climate agenda. So I truly believe you can help us advance Justice 40 in a couple of ways. And this is where if, if I was in the classroom and I asked you all to take out a pen, but I'm sure you all can get it. So I'm going to just give you a couple of things. So first, it's so important, even as we think about all of these new funds and resources, which is amazing, that we have to continue to care for the communities that you're in by focusing on their everyday problems. So whether it's bad air, lack of access to water, poverty. Again, we can't forget the everyday issues that people are dealing about. And so we know that working on climate change and health directly relates to the work we need to continue doing to address these realities, particularly in our low-income communities and communities of color. Secondly, it's important that, and I think you're already doing this, building strong relationships with your state and local government leaders educate them on the importance of not only climate and health, but of the Justice 40 initiative. Because again, the availability of funds that come from our federal agencies to our state agencies is critical. And sometimes they might be unsure about what Justice 40 means, how they can prioritize getting these resources to communities that need it the most. And so that's where we need other voices. Again, we have limits from the federal government level, but you have voices and you have power and you have advocacy. advocacy. Third, helping identify or provide technical assistance to community-based organizations to help apply for these funds. Okay, so the first was to take care of the issues that folks are dealing with, but the third is to help them get some of this money, right? I mean, we hear constantly, and I've been on the other side, I've been a grant seeker and trying to understand the mystical process of the federal government. And again, if we do not do something different to make sure folks can access. We're going to see the same results, the same people getting the same funds. So again, you know, work to provide technical assistance. And I think about a lot of the smaller, lower capacity organizations that we hear from that are just trying to get ready for these funds, because it's, it's a pretty tight timeline with some of these things. So any way you can help bring resources in would be major. And fourth, I encourage you to galvanize groups on the ground to help us make sure that we are actually meeting our 40% goal. I talk a lot to my staff about accountability because that is major for me wherever you're sitting. And so one of the things that we continue to do and, and really appreciate that this is a first time initiative. OK, this Justice Word initiative is a big deal. And, and in some ways, we're, we're, we're flying the plane while we're building it. But what I want to make sure of is that we have something in place, some type of infrastructure that says, hey, that money got to the places where it needs to. And a lot of the conversations I'd have with our state and local leaders is that, you know, sometimes we don't have the data, we don't have the infrastructure. And I think in any way, if you're able to galvanize folks and come together and figure like, what are those metrics or things we need to track to make sure that money is landing in the right place, that would be a huge help. And last but not least, we need to make sure that the local and granular data that you all are collecting is used as a part of our tool. And so again, we know data drives decisions, and that is why our federal agencies are using the CGIS tool to help with the Justice 40 initiative. But again, as new climate and health data comes out, please keep us informed, let us know. And I encourage you to use the tool and add on your own data layers as you continue your advocacy in your different places. So again, I encourage you to continue to seize this moment. Um, for climate action, because we have a window of opportunity we cannot take for granted. Time is going. And so in your work as physicians and public health professionals or advocates, you have the power to change the culture of your labs, your hospitals, your offices, et cetera, et cetera. You have the power, and I just love the presentations, uh, to open folks' minds. You know, I love speaking to a quiet room because that, that's that people are, are listening, they're taking it in. And so you can teach and train and share folks with folks the impacts of climate change, and they've never heard it before. So that's important. And most importantly, you have the power to shift your practice and the way you relate to your patients, bringing climate change into the examination room and taking the practice beyond your office walls and into advocacy and into the halls of Congress. Again, 
The power each of you possesses to change culture and change hearts and minds and practice is so important. So we can all use this moment to create the new reality we desire. I imagine a day when our reality is that no one dies from extreme heat, that the cases of asthma drop to zero, that our community infrastructure is more than prepared to handle the extremes of our weather, as well as our people, that we are no longer relying on dirty energy to power our country, and that health and justice is afforded to everyone, not just the folks that live in a certain zip code or have a large enough income or have connections. And so again, I thank each of you from the bottom of the heart for your leadership, your advocacy, and your everyday practice to do no harm. And I look forward to making your vision and my vision a reality together. Thank you.